So I was kind of catching up on some of my subscriptions on YouTube, if you will, and I finally watched Linus's video about why he still loves Intel. And he said something in that video that, that sort of, I don't want to say triggered me, but it made me realize he was wrong on something. Uh-oh, Jay says Linus is wrong. No, it, this was prior to the launch of the 10th gen reviews that you guys have all seen go live. And I think he put that video live a day before. But he said in there, early reports seem to indicate that Intel's geriatric 14 nanometer process with however many pluses we're adding to the end of it by now is gonna be used to build 10 core chips that will run at 80 plus degrees underwater out of the box without any overclocking. He was wrong about that because of the substrate redesign, the IHS redesign, the material they're using redesign um, shows that these chips are actually doing pretty good when it comes to temperature. So today we're gonna kinda do two things. One, we're gonna take a look at the redesigned Kraken Z series AIOs. This happens to be the Z63, which has the LCD screen on it. And I'm going with this cooler for the specific reason that it's the redesigned cooling plate on there, which is larger and more efficient. So we're going with this new cooler plus the redesigned IHS to kind of show from a new baseline, ground zero, zero, ground zero cooling, what happens with the 10900K at both stock speeds and overclocked? Because like I said, Linus was wrong. The new PureBase 500DX case from Be Quiet is optimized for airflow and maximum performance. Ample interior space offers plenty of room for oversized graphics cards, while the three pre-installed PureWings 2 fans and mesh panel design provide plenty of airflow for both air-cooled and water-cooled systems. And if it's flashy year after, the integrated ARGB illumination and tempered glass bring elegance to the PureBase 500DX. To learn more and see current pricing, click the link in the description below. So I'm using the 280, or the, the new Z63, honestly because of its LCD screen on top. And um, full disclosure, NZXT did send me this. Um, so we are taking a look at this because of uh, the fact that they sent it to us. But we've, we've done an ad on this before. And I, I like the fact that it's got the LCD screen on top because on a test bench, it'd be nice to be able to just kind of quick glance at it and see what the temperatures and stuff are on it. But like we said already, 280 is the biggest that I could go with on here. And as you can see, because we are using the bracket, the, the additional bracket on the side. It actually looks nicer too, because it fills it out. Like there's not that weird gap. All right, so there is our Z63 installed. I'm using the fans that came with it, using the pre-applied thermal paste. I, I'm trying to recreate here what a builder would experience out of the box, using the fans that came with it. I'm not going better thermal paste, better fans. Yes, we are in an open air test bench, because one of the things that we're not testing here is how much does your case affect your cooling. And I have to defend this point every single time I make this video, like a video regarding temperatures in an open test bench. And every single time we got the same people that come and make the comments about that's not, that's not, the, that's not a user experience. People don't do that. Well, I tell you what, if anyone can prove, point to me to the one case that will be applicable to every user in the planet, I'll use that case. In the meantime, the only thing that's now going to be affecting the cooling <clears throat> is the cooler itself. And, and no, don't give me that whole like, oh, this case is probably close to most. No, you need to give me factual, actual numbers. This case is applicable to everybody. You can't. That's why I'm making that claim because you can't do it. It doesn't exist. All right, so we're up and running. You can see the LCD is sideways to your view, but it's facing correct from the motherboard. Um, the LCD screen is showing us what our current CPU temperature is, and you can change that inside of CAM software, and we'll take a look at that in a sec, to show GPU temp, uh, liquid temp. There are some BIOS changes here that we want to make sure that we show you guys. We are running XMP1, which is just speeding up our RAM to its printed RAM speeds. So we don't care about the scores or anything. We obviously care about temperatures. Uh, but we also turned off the multi-core enhancement with ASUS. There's three options, enabled, disabled, and auto. Auto is where it's at by default. It lets BIOS optimize, which means let ASUS's logic, ASUS's? Is that the possessive of ASUS, ASUS's? Um, letting ASUS's logic control the speeds and the turbo frequencies and how many cores turbo to what. We don't want that. We wanna see what out of the box settings for the 10900K is, so we need to disable that. The other thing I'm gonna be doing in here too is um, I'm kind of like, I'm one of those people that prefer performance over acoustics, so I always run my fans faster. But I do have it set to 600 RPM lower limit, which means the fans um, for like the cooler and the uh, little doohickey I got there 
The lowering down on the VRMs, they are going to be no lower than 600 RPM at idle. In fact, I've got to do that for the chassis fan now. All right, so you can see our pump RPM is running right there. Our liquid temp, our GPU temp, and our CPU temp are showing. So when we're doing these tests, these are the two things we kind of care about. What's the CPU temp doing and what's the liquid temperature doing? So if you see the CPU temp excessively high and the liquid temp is excessively high, and by excessive, I mean, let's say over 40 C on the liquid, that's a good indicator that your cooler isn't able to handle the amount of heat being pumped into it. But if you see the liquid temp doing well and the CPU temp going up, well, that could be one of two things. One, you could have a bad mount, it's not making good contact with the CPU, um, or it could just mean it's a hot CPU. Like the architecture itself is just hot on the inside and it doesn't efficiently get the heat to come out. If we take a look at our cooler, you can change the LCD display. So dual infographic shows us CPU and GPU. I wish we could make it show us CPU in liquid. CPU clock speed, okay, we'll do that. So now what it's gonna do is it's gonna change between those three settings right there. So it's gonna show us CPU temperature, liquid temperature, and CPU speed. So I think that'll be handy while we're doing our test. Um, Cam is a piece of free software, so you can download it to use it to monitor your PC stats, as we can see here, temperature, clock speeds, fan speeds, all that information is showing up. And then if you have NZXT products, like anything RGB from them, obviously the coolers, their power supplies, their motherboards, you can have more control over that sort of stuff. All right, so we're gonna be monitoring with Cam because we can see on the screen quickly and easily. We're running it on Cinebench uh, R20. This is a very difficult test to run, it's very hot. Anyone that has run R20 knows that this will bring your CPU to its knees if you let it loop. We have it running for 900 seconds, that's 15 minutes. That should be plenty of time to let our liquid temperature equalize. I don't care what the CPU temperature says in terms of plateauing, we need the liquid temperature to plateau. Once that's plateaued, we know we've reached equilibrium, that's as hot as it's gonna get. The test is looping, it's repeating itself with the same load. So once this has stopped climbing, we'll know those are our max temperatures. And then we'll rinse and repeat <clears throat> with a manual overclock to see what happens. We're probably only about seven minutes or so into this and we're just gonna call it here. CPU capped out at 46 degrees. Our liquid temperature only came up a few degrees. What was it, like 24 when we started? 23, 24, and now it's at 26, CPU's at 46. And that's simply because it is at four point, technically 4.3 gigahertz all core. I think the B clock dropped down to like 99.2 or something like that, which is why it shows an odd number. That's because of the, well, velocity, thermal velocity boost. Well, that doesn't even apply to all core. That's a, sing, that's a single core thing. But the turbo logic, past 56 seconds, we showed you by default, will then reduce the core clocks to stay well below its power draw limits. And what happens is, if you're running a test consistently like this, and it's not bursty, because it wants it to self boost its, its clocks under bursty workloads. You launch a program and then suddenly it's a burst workload and it only runs for a few seconds and then it comes back down. When you're doing a sustained workload like this, it doesn't have time for it to reset the timer. So it just drops the clocks and it stays there. Even though there's plenty of temperature headroom and I'm pretty much guaranteed these clocks, plenty of power limit headroom. But this is the way Intel designed it out of the box. And a lot of people could say, well, that's because if you don't, it's gonna melt itself down. And that's exactly what it is that we're testing right here. So if I stop this test, watch how quickly the temperature will come back down. CPU dropped to 26 instantly, and it will take time for that, C that liquid temp to come down as well. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna restart into our BIOS. We're going to remove those limits. We're gonna let ASUS take over the handling of the clock speeds. We're gonna see what it boosts to with the temperatures being as good as they are. Um, so we can just do enabled, remove all limits. We'll just go that route right away. CPU power management. So maximum core temperature uh, is uh, 115, sure, why not? It's not gonna hit it. All right, long duration package power limit. That's the one that uh, limits how many watts can be pulled over time. Now we can change this to like, 4,095, it's never gonna pull that kind of power. And then the power time window, that's the one that defaults to 56 seconds. Like I told Phil, it goes to 448 seconds. And then we're gonna change this also to like as many watts as it can pull. All right, so we're past the first minute of the test. You can see we're still holding at 4.9 gigahertz, which is the all core turbo. You can see our CPU though is like bumping 60. Although our liquid temperature is still one C below where it was in the last tense test, you can see we are up 15 or so C on the CPU. Because I was saying it earlier in this video, right? The frequency determines the temperature just as much as voltage. Now what's I'm sure happening is voltage is set to auto is it's bumping up voltage as well. So we probably saw an automatic increase of voltage 
and we're seeing the, and that's to maintain the 4.9 gigahertz. Um, core temps are still sitting in the mid 60s. So they've come up a couple of degrees. A few of them are down into the 50s. But I mean, so far, just an out of the box 280 millimeter AIO, which is still not even ramped up the fans. They moved up a little bit. The air coming out of it's nice and cool. I wouldn't call this meltdown. That's a, that's a security flaw. You know, a lot of this though is directly attributed to the redesign of the IHS for this particular CPU, which is kind of sad that it took AMD doing so well with their, their Ryzen setups and their, their IHS design on their coolers for Intel to finally do something. We've been complaining about temperatures on mainstream Intel since fourth gen. 4770K was the first one we were like, what the hell? Because the 3770 jumped to a 4770. It was just so damn hot. And it took all the way now to 10th gen for them to finally, what appears to be some sort of a, a redesign. Because we know it's a different thermal compound that's in there. It's like a, I, I can't remember exactly what they call it, but it's a it's a liquid metal-esque kind of a thing. But again, they have changed the way that the contact is underneath. They had to. The core density in this particular package size, <laughs> ladies, is just extremely dense. So we've just hit the, the halfway mark on our test and our liquid temperature has still maxed out at 26 C and our CPU is bouncing between 60 and 61. Core temps are all, the hottest the core got was 64 C, no 65 C. It's interesting, you know, because they're much closer together than they used to be. When we would do this with the 9900K, we would see like sometimes up to 14 degrees difference between the coldest and hottest core. So we know that the, the IHS redesign and the stim is doing something. I think anyone right now running a, a 9900K doing this test would probably see much hotter temperatures. I would venture to say at least 10 C hotter across the board. And remember, we've got two extra cores in here, four extra threads doing something on this test. All right, now let's see how far we can push this thing before it really becomes a problem. It's still Intel after all. We are gonna bring our AVX instruction offset to zero though. Uh, CPU core ratio, we're gonna sync all cores and we're gonna bring them to 5.2 gigahertz. And I'm gonna leave the voltage to auto. I don't know if I'm gonna regret that decision. All right, so it is currently, oh, 1.57 volts. <laughs> need a blast shield right here. Okay, I think that I need to tune the voltage a little bit. All right, here we go. Eighty, eighty-eight, eighty-nine, ninety. It's in the eighties. What's the V core at? Did it droop? Oh yeah, it dropped to 1.4, 1.403. Well, the liquid temp's already 27. Remember, we were on the test last time for over 10 minutes for it to hit 27. It's yeah. there now in like one pass. So it's at 1.394, bouncing 1.403. Uh, I don't think it needs that much. Oh, we hit 95, 96 on some cores. Coldest core is 88, hottest core is 96. Liquid hit 30. Look at how much heat we're having to pump into this before this, the, the Z63. So remember earlier I said, coolant temp tells you the whole story. If the coolant temp climbs and runs away, that means you are overpowering your cooler. It means the actual TDP or the amount of heat that the cooler can handle is less than the heat being applied to it. So it will continue to increase. Our liquid temp is only three C higher than our last test, three or four C I think. But we're 31, 32 C higher on the CPU temperature. So that just shows you right there, that is heat just because of the amount of voltage being pumped into it. And that's just the architecture getting hot where if our liquid temp was just running away and going, you know, 35, 44, and you'd be surprised how fast that climbs once, once the cooler is completely heat soaked and it can't move anymore, exchange any more heat, it just runs away fast. But that's not what we're getting here. So I think what we'll do right now is we'll let this test run. We'll see where that equalizes. And then we'll, I mean, I think we'll adjust the voltage to a realistic setting. We've been running for nearly 15 minutes now. We've totally hit equilibrium. In fact, we came down one degree. It was totally plateaued at 31 and then it dropped down to 30. Our cores though all also equalized. They're sitting in the high 80s, low 90s right now, but their peak, their max temperatures they achieved at all was anywhere between 92 and 99. There's two ways you can look at that. 
That's below the out of the box TJ Maxx of 105. I set it to 115, obviously. But that's clearly too hot for day to day use if you're running tasks that hammer the CPU this hard for this long. Most people in like, if you're not doing like folding at home or like have a render farm and you're encoding video all day long are not, and even Adobe won't push the CPU this hard. This, this Cinebench R20 is an extremely difficult test to run. So I'm sure most people like myself would also agree that that's still too close for comfort on the temperatures. Even if gaming only hit 60C or something like that, I still wouldn't be comfortable with those temperatures. So what we're gonna do right now is I'm gonna go in just one more time to the BIOS and I'm gonna drop the voltage down a bit just to see if I can get 5.2 to run stable at like, let's say 1.35. Look at those temps already, 60s, 60s. Remember last time it went right to the 80s and 90s like immediately? Same speed, 5.2 all core, but by simply going in and reducing the voltage from it thought it needed, look at this, 63, 61, 64, 64, 65, 65, 65, 64, 61, 62. Max temperatures, look at that. None of them even come near, well, one came near 70 at the 68. Intel's redesign of the IHS on the 10900K is effective. They should have done this shit a long time ago. We've, we have suffered with their half-assery of cooling their chips since, like I said, the oh. fourth. <laughs> Just a little bit more voltage. Just add a little more. I put it at 1.36 volts now and it's working fine. But back to what I was saying, we've been dealing with Intel's half-assery since fourth gen. I've already talked about that. And this was actually a big marketing push with this particular CPU that it was um, redesigned in that aspect. But as you can see too, obviously just a, a simple AIO like the Z63 here from NZXT, although it's not that simple because it's got this cool display on it. And I can see right now the liquid's at 25, CPU's at 5200 megahertz, and it, CPU's at 64. Overclocked to 5.2, 5, 5.2 5, 5. gigahertz all core, a simple 280 millimeter AIO off the shelf, no custom cooling or anything like that is able to keep this CPU in check. What we kind of talked about too was it's not so much Cooler is having to do extra work to cool the Intel. It's just the Intel couldn't get the heat out of its own damn package to get cooled anyway. So yeah. Um, I was just poking fun at, at Linus at the beginning of this video. I, I know he made that video prior to the review, but it doesn't help that that video went live a day before the review. And I didn't watch his review, so I don't know what he had to say about temperatures. But I can tell you that when we were overclocking and testing this CPU during our benchmarks for the launch day uh, video, I basically went running into Phil and I was like, dude, this thing runs cold. Like this thing is really cold. So there you go. Guys, thanks for watching. If you had any concerns about the 10900K, if you're gonna be running it in your system, I mean, we already know that the 3900X has dropped in price to being nearly $100 cheaper than this CPU. But if you are running it and you're concerned about temperatures, you don't really need to be. And I still don't think we got a very good chip right here because I can't run 5.3 all core, period, at all. Um, and I still think this takes more voltage to run 5.2 than a lot of other people were having to deal with. So we sort of have a sample here that's very indicative, I think, of real world um, scenario in terms of silicon lottery. I think we're like right in the middle. It's not a great chip, but it's not a dud. It's just there, if that makes sense. All right, guys, thanks for watching. If you got any other tests you think we should do on this, maybe we should hook something up to it. Do you think we should go back to air conditioner cooling and see what kind of scores we can get out of this thing? I think Steve's probably hooked liquid nitrogen up to it, but. I mean, Steve hooks liquid nitrogen up to anything that thinks. Do you think he liquid nitrogen cools his girlfriend? <laughs>